Welcome to the Possibility Hub video series. I'm Carol Talbot, the creator and founder of the Possibility Hub, an advocate for awakening, encouragement, and creating opportunities for an expansion of awareness and consciousness. In this episode, I'm back in conversation with detoxification and cellular rejuvenation specialist, Malcolm Sleiper, for part four of our detox series. Now, Malcolm has traveled extensively seeking out various healing modalities, and the core of his interest lies in restoring natural balance and harmony through detoxification and through a simple three-pillar method. In this session, we're talking about fasting, the different methods of fasting, the benefits, and a few additions to assist you during your fast. Malcolm, here we are, part four of our detox series, and excited where it's leading us. And um, I think it would be really useful to recap on the first three stages, uh, because there is a sequence of, of videos for a specific purpose before we get into today's topic of the actual fast now. Great. Um, hi there, Carol, and uh, great to be back. Um, so a very quick overview of uh, what brings us to today's topic, which uh, is an overview onto fasting or an introduction into fasting. Um, the, if we go back to our first session, we discussed uh, the concept of um, what we called human food versus non-human food. So in other words, if we found ourselves in a situation and we wish to extract ourselves from the situation, we'd like to stop doing the things that were accelerating it or making it worse and uh, this usually returns to the damage we do to ourselves with our knife and fork and uh, ideally what we'd like to do is to move towards foods that encourage healing and eventually uh, encourage full rejuvenation of the body and uh, ultimately prepare us for the fast so this phase we called the pre-cleanse and ideally we went from processed foods uh, typically uh, foods that um, a rough snapshot, a guideline of this is when we walk into a supermarket, um, the foods that we find in the aisles um, are generally processed foods, they stored foods, they tin foods, those are the foods we wanted to avoid and we wanted to move more towards the foods we found in the fresh food section um, and going one step closer, uh, deeper into that, uh, the more we could move towards a vegetarian or a vegan type diet, minimizing these extracted uh, or processed foods would greatly help us. Um, once the body senses that it's uh, that the onslaught of toxic food has stopped, um, it starts to go through a self-corrective mechanism, which would uh, take us through this roughly four week period as we prepare for the fast. The next stage or the next part of um, the process, which went hand in hand with cleaning up our diet, went in cleaning out the body's five elimination organs. And we said there were five of them, three of which we had easy access to. The lungs, uh, as an example, uh, were pretty obvious um, in terms of dealing with, if you're a stoper, smoker, you stop smoking, we get, uh, try and get access to cleaner, fresher air. Um, so they essentially were quite easy to deal with. So essentially we're looking at working with the bowel looking with working with the kidneys and we were looking at working with the liver. And all three of those within the framework of um, this pre-cleanse and the, the various tools that we have were pretty easy um, with a little bit of applied discipline to begin uh, to clean up. That would happen today, wouldn't it? Um, and so, of course, if you're eating more fruit and vegetables, um, and real food rather than processed food, then those elimination organs, you know, start to kick back in and do what they do best. Yeah. Um, ideally, in, in the ideal environment, they, 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 uh, the body is a self-correcting mechanism, but sometimes it needs a little bit of help. Uh, like any filter in the body, uh, they do become clogged and uh, congested. And it really behooves us in terms of where we're moving to with the fast uh, to have these five organs in tip-top condition because during the fast, the body's going to release an, a significant, an amazing amount um, of debris, toxin, parasite, diaph, and all sorts of things. And uh, if the 
elimin elimination channels, these filters um, can't cope with the onslaught of what's being released. This gets recirculated, leaving the person feeling really grotty and lousy. I always liken it to when I speak with people about, you know, cleansing and cleaning up their system, a little bit like um, if you've made scrambled eggs the old way in a pot. And, uh, you know, you can't just clean the pot afterwards. It needs to soak for a while. So it's, you know, the same with uh, your gut. You know, if you consider all the different foods that put in there, you put in there, and particularly, you know, dairy, cheese and things, which really um, is, is tough on the digestive system to get through, then it's going to need a little bit of soaking <laughs> to start <laughs> eliminating, which again is the importance of this pre-cleanse phase. So yes. then we, so we've, um, you know, eating more um, healthy food, fruits, vegetables, then we've got the five organs of elimination and they may, may need a little help to kickstart. Then last week, we also touched on that <laughs> wonderful topic <laughs> of parasites. So I hope we haven't put people off by then. <laughs> and the slavery topic of parasites, yeah. Um, and what really comes out of there is we in the Western world, in our, um, our sophisticated way of, of living, we think we're right up there at the top of the food chain. And uh, we think that parasites are a third world problem. Nothing could be further from the truth. Um, the uh, schools of thought I've been exposed to talk of a great parasite plague that uh, that the earth is going through, and uh, they are absolutely everywhere. And unless you mitigate against these and you take precaution and you work with uh, the various modalities that we touched on in the talk, um, then we become what's for lunch. Um, sometimes <laughs> it's an insidious thing, and it just eats away and eats away, and some people call this um, aging and or degenerative aging. Um, some schools of thought said contributes majorly, significantly to uh, disease and a lot of the, um, the disease states that we know and we give fancy names to. So we also mentioned some of the things that the Art of Detox and you recommend to people in terms of there's many, many, many natural herbs to start cleaning up the body and cleansing of parasites. And uh, you and the Art of Detox have, have developed a lot of your own intestinal bulldozers, parasite cleansers and things like that. So here we are at the phase now, the fourth phase of actually going into a cleanse. So what's the kind of background in terms of the cleanse that you've developed? Because I know you've traveled extensively and really you know, researched this topic of what works, what doesn't work. What's the background there? I was particularly inspired in the early days by um, reading into the old medical books, these old history books whereby um, doctors from the 18th century and uh, the 19th century had written their life history and what they'd found had worked. And then at the end of their life, they wrote um, some pretty remarkable books, not because they wanted to make a quick buck, but because they were passing invaluable knowledge onto the next generation. And in a way, we've lost touch with this, um, this wisdom, this age-old wisdom that gets parted down. So um, during the 18th century, uh, in the late 18th century, there were a bunch of what they called orange juice doctors. And these guys were generally uh, Civil War babies. So they grew up at the time of the American Civil War, and then they matured their careers into the late 1800s. And uh, there was one particular um, doctor who, who was a qualified surgeon, in fact, um, who had um, heart disease. And uh, he started to embark upon what they would call these orange juice fasts. And they would fast them literally on, on orange juice or di diluted orange juice for extended periods of time, so up to 20, 30, 40 days. And uh, the track record was that there was this enormous rejuvenation and restoration of health that went about during this process. Now, they didn't use herbs and other supplements and colonics and animals and all sorts of things. They would, they would just buckle down and, and do these long fasts. So um, having read these books and um, becoming exposed to a mentor herbalist who um, was very instrumental in my um, schooling, um, I started to embrace these fasts to address a condition of my own. And um, I found the turnaround within the, as little as seven to, to 10 days was just extraordinary. 
So um, over a period of time, I would return to the tropics. I love to go to Thailand. I enjoyed fasting in Thailand and I would embody this method and I'd develop and refine it. And then I'd add in and blend in different modalities. So we would do the parasite cleanses. We'd throw those in. We would uh, work with different herbal, um, sorry, different uh, massages that I'd encounter in Thailand and slowly refine the, uh, the system of fasting that I share with um, my clients today. And uh, it's pretty, it's a pretty extraordinary method of restoration. So let's go into the different types of fasting that you recommend, because, you know, we can go all the way from, uh, you know, diet to juicing to a water fast where it's purely water. And I also recall one fast you did, which was coconut water as well, if I'm not mistaken. That was in Thailand. Um, so what are the different methods uh, you would advise for fasting and, and what some of the benefits uh, because I know when you say to people a water fast, it's, um, you know, and if they're looking at seven to 10 days, there's a kind of like um, <laughs> a deer in headlight look. It's like, ah, you, you must be kidding. How can we live alone on water? And yet uh, I always liken it that if you're unwell, you don't want to eat. The body doesn't want food. It needs hydration. It just doesn't want food because it needs to spend its time rather than on digestion. It needs to eliminate and get rid of, of what's going on in the body. So that with a water fast, it's a wonderful way to reset the system. So let's talk about those different types of, of fasting in this cleanse phase. Great. Yeah. Um, let's first take a step back and, and look at what the concept of fasting is. Um, so basically, in, in a nutshell, fasting is when we change uh, from our modus of operandi that we're uh, our practices that we're on into a different mode of eating. So strictly speaking, that could be considered a fast of sorts. And um, the more uh, refined you make that fast moving towards from simply just changing from a meat eating diet to perhaps a vegan diet or a juicing type of diet down to um, a water fast, the closer you move towards the water fast, uh, the more aggressively the body begins to dig in with this natural uh, innate healing capacity that we're all endowed and blessed with. Um, so the water fast that you've touched on is, is a more extreme version of it. And not many people are ready to go from their day-to-day -day life and jump straight into um, the, um, the rigor of uh, a hardcore water fast. Um, and I say this because as the body, after about the third day when the body senses that uh, something's changed and it realizes, okay, it's, the throat hasn't been cut. It's just, <laughs> a, it's just the, the onslaught of food has stopped. It changes mode from a house cleaning mode into a maintenance mode. Um, and depending on the type of fast we use, um, it could go very, very deep into this house cleaning mode. And if you haven't cleaned up these organs of elimination and you haven't prepared, this can be an extremely, extremely um, rough ride for, <laughs> for yes. the horrified spectator. <laughs> yeah. yeah, people get headaches and all sorts of things. Um, and I would say with a water fast, you know, um, if you prepared well, then it's very easy. So for example, I'm very blessed. I, I don't drink coffee. Um, I'm vegan anyway. I eat a fairly light diet. So uh, I, I still find that day three, day four is the tipping point. After that, it becomes so easy. Um, the only thing I'd say is with a water fast, it it just gets a little boring. <laughs> the boredom ultimately is what gets us. I know. I think the longest I've done is about nine days, and I felt yeah. that I could keep going and yeah. keep going, keep going. Um, so, so you, there is a tipping point. I agree. Yeah. Um, after about the third day, the body senses this this change of um, of, of onslaught of foods, and it goes into this house cleaning mode. Um, and uh, it'll start to dig in deeper and deeper over a period of time until ultimately the work is done. And during this transition from the time it realizes there's a change until the, the end of the fast, 
Um, it's not a linear progression. So at stages, the body's intelligence will dive in deeper, um, clear stuff out, and then it'll go through a resting phase and then dive in deeper until at some stage the, the fast ends. But we don't need to go through this hardcore uh, water fast. There are ways of, of fasting that still get most of the benefits of, benefits of a water fast, but without the extreme um, um, change and transition that the body is going to experience, the symptoms that it's going to throw up, the, the lack of energy, the lethargy, uh, the need to literally uh, sit completely still and, and do nothing. Uh, which is uh, which accompanies the water fast. So for that reason, I found if we use diluted fruit juices, um, and this could be the the, op the obvious one that I turn to because it's just so easy to find everywhere, is a diluted orange juice. And what we would do is essentially from seven or eight in the morning until six in the evening, on the hour, every hour, we would have one glass of diluted orange juice and uh, we would mix in, I use distilled water, we put water in with that. And then in the hours in between, or the half hour in between, you could have as much water and as much tea as you like. We also augment that fast um, with uh, a bowel formula, the intestinal bulldozer, because that keeps uh, the bowel moving through the duration of the fast. And um, when one of the physiological effects on the body is once we've stopped eating, obviously the bowel will stop moving. But this, this doesn't serve us because the bowel is one of the mechanisms that the body's eliminating its waste. So um, if the bowel stops moving, we wind up recirculating the waste, which is counterproductive to the fast. So the different ways of ensuring that the bowel moves and the easiest I've found and the cheapest is using this intestinal uh, formula, the intestinal bulldozer. And we would use several capsules through the day, which makes sure that the tummy moves. Some people like to use colonics, some people do coffee enemas. There are all sorts of ways of doing this. But without an inkling of a doubt, this intestinal formula is the easiest way to ensure the, the tummy moves. Um, and another thing, Carol, that I found is that's fascinating is that we've stopped eating now for several days. And yet, when if one pays attention to what's coming out, you're in absolute awe by how much is being released. <laughs> then, oh, I haven't eaten. <laughs> Where is this stuff coming from? And yet this intestinal bulldozer goes in and it scrapes this waste off um, the, the colon walls. It pulls it out of the small intestine. All the mud, these old herbalists used to talk about mud that was backed up into the, uh, into the cavities and the organs of the body. So this mud starts to get released and we have this, this literal release over all these days of the fasting of this mud coming out. People um, often uh, approach us and they say, will I lose weight? Um, some people are in a position where they've got weight to lose. Um, and uh, often the guideline that I like to suggest to them is that you lose up to two pounds per day that, uh, that just wasn't you that goes down the toilet. And um, this isn't muscle mass that it's consuming. The body won't consume muscle until it's really on the verge of absolute starvation. So this is pulling all this junk, all this mud, all this accumulated matter out of the nooks and crannies of the body and sending it down the toilet. Wonderful. Now, you mentioned orange juice. And my question around orange juice is uh, because it's a juice that I've very rarely had because personally, I find it very acidic mm. on the stomach. So mm. is, is that a problem for some people? The acidity of, I mean, I always have um, hot water and lemon in the morning, mm. because as we know, when lemon goes into the system, it becomes alkaline. Um, mm. Is that the same with orange? Because I haven't found it. I find it a little too ac acidic for me. Or mm. is that the purpose of diluting it? Yeah, some people don't like orange juice because of this so-called acidity um, to their tongue. So some people are just, just adverse to it. So there are other juices we could use. We could use grapefruit, which uh, would still be astringent. Um, all of these fruits that I'm re recommending are semi-acid fruits. So the orange, the lemon, um, the, uh, the grapefruit, these are semi-acid fruits. And all of them, when they've gone through the combustion uh, process within the through the digestive system, the combustion process that comes from it, the, the ash that remains behind is, is not acid ash, it's alkaline ash 
which the body uses to rebuild its alkaline reserves. Um, so orange juice has this quality that we spoke of earlier called astringency, which is to pull acids out of the cells and then send it to the elimination organs. And this is why it's so effective for the fast. But if we don't like orange juice, we can turn to other things. I've fasted on pineapple juice. I've uh, fasted extensively on coconut water juice. Yes. Um, the coconut water is um, amazing in that it's uh, so rich in electrolytes and it's rich in potassium uh, and it's rich in many minerals. So you don't need very much coconut water for that day that you're fasting. For the, uh, I think we were using up to three or four coconuts a day. And you'd have half a glass of coconut water and the rest water. And it makes for the most beautiful fasting experience. Um, as I've found and uh, those who've been fasting, we don't uh, encounter hunger after the third day. The appetite completely, completely switches off, which is astounding because uh, this is so contrary to, to what we think would happen when we stop eating. And, well, I always think that people think they're hungry when actually either they're thirsty or another question I often use with clients is, what are you really hungry for? <laughs> you know, in terms of your life, are you hungry for love? Are you hungry for success? Um, you know, are you hungry for material objects? What are you really hungry for? And we've been taught from a very early age, you know, to go for food. I mean, parents, you know, weren't, weren't being wicked. And when you see children upset and cry, what do they do? They get a biscuit, they get something sweet, they get something sugary. Um, and this is how we find comfort in sweet and sugary stuff or in food, because that's what we've been taught since we were young. So again, it's not just retraining the body, it's retraining the, the mind. Um, and also I like to remind people when you're about to eat, you know, there, there's a strategy from an NLP perspective of naturally slim people. And they probably don't know they're doing this. And yet in their head, they do a quick check. So if they're presented with a burger, pizza, chips and a salad, they actually future pace Will that give me energy and make me feel good later in an hour or two hours time? Or will the salad make me feel more energized? Yep. And of course, the answer is, is pretty obvious. You know, when we're eating carbs and things, you know, the big <sighs> slump. <It's rough laughs> you know, you, you've been on a, a buffet or as a child, we were told your, your eyes were bigger than your tummy. <laughs> yeah. So, so it's, it's also... You know, when I feel when people are, are fasting, they become amazed that they have more energy, their skin responds, their body responds, they just feel more alive. And not just in terms of energy, but mentally more alert, uh, emotionally, they released a lot of emotions usually during a fast, it can bring up different mood swings, as you probably know and have seen with your clients. And of course, to me, if you want to expand your consciousness, um, you know, it's we're not just looking at the spiritual component. You have to look holistically. That's right. Yeah. Um, fasting, and these are the benefits that you're touching on. So fasting brings upon a plethora of benefits. Um, and science has gone and done an enormous amount of study on this. There, there, there are many um, significant studies that have done on this. But what you're alluding to is this significant freeing up of vital force that occurs because the body's now not preoccupied with uh, having to consume and digest. It can now go into this house cleaning mode, start to clean out uh, down to the deepest levels of the cell. It starts to clean out at the level of the mitochondria. It starts to free up energy there. And the lymphatic system is cleared of its backlog. Um, as you know, and we discussed in our previous talk, um, that the, the lymphatic system is the sewer of the, of the body. So if the sewer is now being cleaned out and uh, the backload from the, the level of the cell, the backlog from the level of the cells being cleared, um, of course we're gonna experience uh, this improved vitality and energy. That normally happens after around, the, from the, the third day to the fifth, the sixth day, the body's usually pretty sluggish, particularly in the first fast. Um, because this is a skill, and then um, as we hone the skill, it becomes easier and easier. But from the seventh day, there's this massive freeing up of vital force, 
um, and a significant rebound of energy and sometimes energy that you haven't experienced, you know, perhaps since you were a kid, since you were in your teens. Yeah, it really is truly mm -hmm. wonderful. Let me bring up this, this uh, uh, slide that we have. Mm. Um, which you may want to sort of talk everyone through because it looks at, um, you know, the levels of detoxification all the way up the top to a, a water fast. Do you want to just quickly um, talk through this? Yeah. Um, uh, with the green a, juice, I've got one here. <laughs> yeah, this is a fascinating um, slide because it gives us a guideline as to the, um, the different food types we can consume, which have a cleansing effect in the body that ultimately lead up to, as we said, the extreme of fasting, which is the water fast. But we can achieve all the benefits of the water fast, or practically all the benefits of the water fast, with um, fasting with one particular juice, such as an orange juice or um, coconut water, in the diluted pineapple juice um, will give you all of these. So um, if the fast is going too quickly, in other words, it's unleashing too much of this onslaught of uh, toxic release in the body, um, you can move back down this pyramid and this would slow down the fast. It would slow down the detox that's going on. But if you want to see the ultimate effect of what's going on, a snapshot of what's going on, I'd like to um, ask you to bring up the next slide, which is that dark field uh, blood. Um, if one were to take a snapshot of the blood on the first day of the fast and you looked at this under a microscope and um, this particular technology is called dark field microscopy and uh, what you would see is the snapshot of the intracellular blood so you'd see a whole lot of red blood cells um, and judging by or, or gauging by their size their shape how badly they clump together, we can get a, an idea of the well, the well-being um, of the uh, circulatory system, the blood, which is a snapshot of what's going on in the body. But if we took that same picture again, uh, that same snapshot on the tenth day of the fast, um, there's a significant improvement to the blood that has occurred, and you'd see that um, the little red blood cells are more spaced out. And this is, um, this is, this goes up the spacing of the blood cells goes about the body's ability to transport oxygen around the system. So it's obvious then that if the cells are more separated, what this tells us is that the body's uh, ability to transport oxygen is enhanced. You'll find that there's a repair that's occurred on, the, um, on each individual cell. Uh, they're more rounded in shape. Any intracellular debris within the circulatory system, within that, uh, that blood, has been cleared up. Um, the first picture might have revealed little parasites floating around in there. And by the 10th day, these have, for the most part, been cleared out. And this shot, this picture is so powerful because it tells us what exactly is happening within the body. And um, when I take these people away to do uh, fasting retreats in Thailand, I always take a picture on the first day and a picture on the last day of the fast. And it's such a confidence boost and a reinforcement of all the hard work that they've put in over these 10 days. It's incredibly motivating to a person to have seen the progress that they've made. Now, obviously, it's much easier to do this process when, uh, like you say, you take your, your groups on, on trips to specific places and they immerse themselves for 10 days. And if people are doing this, you know, at home um, by themselves, 10 days may seem a little daunting or may seem, you know, impractical, particularly in this day and age when so much of socializing or business is around food. So do you recommend that people maybe start on a shorter fast and then, you know, every few months build up to slightly mm. longer? Yeah, that's a great point that, uh, that you bring up. Um, fasting is a skill. So um, some people have never done a fast and most people haven't done a fast uh, before. Um, so we should start with short fasts and uh, we could do um, take one day of the week, for instance, take a Sunday and um, we perhaps just juice on that Sunday. So that's an, a sort of a fast. Or you could uh, go into um, a water fast for that day. We could build up the skill over three days. So we eat clean for a week and then we do three days of juicing. 
So that's a mini fast. And then when people gain confidence and they realize that death isn't around the corner because they're not eating every few hours, um, they get confident by, or they, they, they start to cultivate confidence to be able to do a longer fast. And then we'd go from a three-day fast a few weeks later, a few days later, you could do a seven-day fast. And again, the same process happens. We see that great things um, occur, that many benefits that, that happen, we lose weight, uh, we feel better, we've got more vitality and energy. So this inspires someone to do a longer one. And um, ideally, for, for most people who aren't addressing really serious conditions, a 10 or a 14 day fast is more than sufficient to do once um, a year. If you're looking for much deeper work, you could even do that twice a year. And of course, the important thing here as we finish off this conversation, this fourth part is coming out of the fast, uh, yeah. you know, because, uh, you know, it's not just rushing off to your favorite restaurant and gorging yourself because you're actually going to harm yourself. And I do recall um, coming out of a nine, nine, 10 day water fast and I had people around for dinner. Um, and of course, the benefit is anything you eat just tastes delicious but the temptation then is to eat too much and I certainly suffered badly I mean it was like um you know while you're eating is fine but this is the beauty of eating slowly and and taking time between courses because afterwards honestly it was like a brick in my stomach it was a real big mistake so um is it if you've gone the whole water fast then easing back into juicing and gradually introducing some healthy foods again um, the coming off the fast is probably the more difficult part um, of this whole experience. The actual fasting part is, is contrary to popular opinion or uh, to um, perception, is, uh, is really the more challenging. And with the longer fast, these long water fasts, if somebody was doing that, is, is probably the more dangerous part of the experience. Um, so it really is important that uh, people plan coming off the fast, um, really have a plan and you work towards the plan. So um, had you been fasting on juice, you'd probably treat the day, um, uh, cut the next day coming off the fast as very much uh, another juicing day, but perhaps with a, a solid uh, with a fruit meal at the end. Um, there's some fruits that really favor fasting. So for instance, figs. Just having a mono meal of figs at the end of that day and considering that to be the breaking of the fast. And these figs will help to pull these toxins, this, these acids that have been released, this, this morbid uh, matter that's accumulated within the system. It helps it to release that. Then the next day we treat as a juicing fast again, but we could perhaps throw in some more fruit during that day. The third day I would go back to salads, to raw salads. And only from the fourth day onwards would I start thinking of introducing cooked food again. So fasting in Thailand, um, we often use these beautiful resorts and these retreats, and they've always got these incredible raw food restaurants, and people have spent the time in the, the fast, the two weeks, antagonizing themselves by looking at the menu and planning what they're going to do when they come off. And very often, a lot of these foods are just too rich. They're just too much for the system. Um, and they wind up undoing a lot of the good that was achieved through the fast by choosing the wrong foods um, and an unconscious approach to, to ending that fast. So it's really, really important to have a disciplined approach to coming off the fast um, and just easing back into a normal way of eating in a very, very gradual way, not being in a hurry to do this. So that's the beauty of also looking at it as a holistic process of a, a mental cleanse, emotional, physical and spiritual cleanse as well. So this has been a fascinating um, uh, four session introduction to detox. Um, and remember that you can contact Malcolm at artofdetox.com. I'll put the links below this video. Any last comments, Malcolm, before we finish today? Yeah. Carol, I think the, the big thing that stands out for me is that um, we take a philosophical look at this and um, the human body is not, contrary to popular opinion, a vacuum cleaner. It requires routine maintenance. It requires um, consideration in terms of what we consider as fuel for this 
incredible, incredible piece of technology. And if we look after it and we, um, we give it the right foods, we clean out these elimination organs on a routine, in a routine manner, uh, we guard against the possibility of parasites. And then from um, several times or twice a year, uh, we do small routine fasts. Um, it really behooves us in terms of cultivating vibrancy and cultivating longevity and cultivating wellness. We all want to be well, and there's a price that we pay for it. And if we make the effort and we have um, a systematic and disciplined approach that we can um, keep to or resort to, uh, we will be beautifully rewarded. Thank you so much. And time for me to go and get a little bit more green juice. <laughs> green juice. Uh, Enjoy great your day. Great Thanks, Carol. Bye-bye.